Ladies, mental gen, rail bikes and rail cars, welcome to another episode of Rank 10 Yu-Gi-Oh's Legacy of the Worthless. If you aren't familiar yet, in this series we're looking at the most unplayable archetypes ever shut out by Konami's executive asshole, what exactly makes those archetypes so horrible, and what could have been improved in order for them to be less awful. The grading scale we use involves consistency, power, comeback ability, protection and versatility, and an archetype is considered terrible if it doesn't excel in any of these categories. With that said, let's begin this episode's topic. Guess who's been scraping the bottom of the barrel recently? Yeah, sadly after slogging through what was it, 10, 11 shitty archetypes so far? I'm a bit burnt out on video ideas, lacking in quality content, also having 5 hour long debates with myself every day about whether Claudians deserve a video or not, so in order to avoid hours of playtesting I made a Pojo account and had them give me suggestions for shitty archetypes to review. So after some kind comments from the people I went and playtested the following 3. Reptilian, the awkward successors of Venoms which do the same thing as them but on a different scale of unplayable. Reactors, because this was originally supposed to be a 5D special but Iron Chains proved a bit too playable. And Old Phantom Beast, because... I needed something to fill up the quota, shut up! So, without any further ado, let's start with Snakes, the next generation! They were used very sparsely by Misty in Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds, and honestly I feel like an idiot for not reviewing them alongside Venoms, but much like the production team of 5Ds, we all make mistakes. <coughs> the first card is the one the archetype primarily relies on to make its plays. Reptilian Naga is a level 1 with 0 attack in defense, cannot be destroyed by battle, the attack of any monster that battles it becomes 0 at the end of the battle phase, but during your end phase if the card is in defense position, switch it to attack position. As opposed to attack reduction being their main goal, which was kinda the case with Venoms, Reptilian are mostly focused on control-based effects related to monsters with zero attack on the field. Surprisingly, they are sorta lacking in this aspect considering the fact that Naga is pretty much the most reliable of their cards when it comes to this kind of attack reduction. Back some time ago it was a decent first turn phase down because you could expect people to run into it and give you a zero attack monster to take care of next turn, but today that kind of tactic is not nearly as viable. To add to this, if you wanna use it more than once, you're gonna be taking quite some damage seeing how it gets locked into attack position position, since, you know, the opponent probably won't be attacking into it, so you have to run it into things yourself. That's really nothing you can benefit from unless you're running damage equals reptile to circumvent damage with generating field presence, or just running spirit barrier to prevent said damage. Also, where is her neck? Is it because she's a snack and snacks don't have necks? I don't know, don't ask me, I'm not a snackologist. So, while Naga decently encapsulates the idea of reptilian and gives you a basic understandable outline on how they're supposed to work, Dragging you back into the land of confusion is Reptilian Servant. It's a level 1 with 100 attack and defense, prevents both players from normal summoning, but it gets destroyed if there are any other face-up monsters on the field, as well as when it's targeted by a spell or trap card effect. I know Hardlick summed it up in the last video, but let's just take a bit of a closer look at this. It's a level 1 non-tuner in a synchro archetype, he has no effects related to attack reduction and its attack isn't zero so it doesn't synergize with the idea of the deck, it's completely useless while there are monsters on the field, only prevents normal summons so setting and special summoning is still completely viable, basically it's a single turn, usually first turn, stall card that barely does anything relevant against decks from 2004, let alone today. Shitty stats, terrible effect, crappy artwork, it's an anime adaptation card if I ever saw one. Speaking of which though, if you haven't watched 5Ds yet, do try and guess which monsters appeared in the anime solely based on the cartoonishness of the artwork. For a hint, there's gonna be two more. And if you get them right, you win a free copy of the first issue of the hottest new card gaming and life pro tip magazine, Ranked and Life. Next up is Reptilian Viper, a level 2 tuner with 0 attack and 0 defense, a piece of cloth to cover up the snack private areas, I guess. And when it's normal summoned, you can take control of one face-up monster your opponent controls that has 0 attack. This here would be an example of one of the earlier mentioned reptilian control effects related to monsters with zero attack, in this case quite literally a control effect, and for what it is, it's a decent card because while it's their only tuner, you can use the monsters you steal from the opponent for a synchro summon, therefore the archetype isn't restricted to their own awkward levels for synchro plays. The downside though is that it's only useful for monsters that already got hit by the reptilian attack drainage, making it inherently bricky, as well as the fact that being one level lower would make it significantly better as a tuner monster, so in the end, while it provides neat utility, it's not worth running at more than 2. Reptilian Gorgon is a level 3 with 1400 attack and defense and when it attacks, after damage calculation the attack of the monster in battle becomes 0 and it cannot change its battle position. 
So it's Naga, but better because it has more attack, but worse because it still gets destroyed by battle and only applies on your battle phase, and it only ends up being useful as a last resort option when you have nothing else to use for attack reduction. I mean, you could still be attacking defense position monsters in order to use them for reptilian effects after the battle phase, but that's such a stupidly specific scenario that it shouldn't even be considered towards the positives of the card. I also like how they slap the battle position restriction on it because that truly compensates for all the downsides. What's next, a synchro monster that when it gets banished it reduces the attack of a monster by 500 or something? Oh. Anyway, as underwhelming as Gorgon is, it's still arguably worth running because relying mainly on Naga for attack reduction is a fairly risky strategy. Reptilian Gardener is a level 4 with 0 attack and 2000 defense, and when he's destroyed and sent to the graveyard, you can add one Reptilian monster from your deck to the hand. For the time, this was legit a really good searcher. First of all, it triggers not only by battle, but also effect destruction, including your own effects, but its stats also heavily complement the archetype because while it acts as a decent wall due to its 2000 defense, its zero attack also makes it usable as tribute fodder for a certain reptilian monster we'll mention later. Garnum was a pretty legit card for the time and is definitely a 3 off staple for the archetype, but the only problem I have with it is that its water attribute, making the usage of Allure of Darkness a risky choice, while the card would otherwise greatly increase the deck's consistency. Also, I love the artwork, it's like, ta-da! I have a turtle! The Gamma Seal before the Gamma Seal. Reptilian Sila, or Skila if you're a Greek, is a level 4 with 1800 attack and 1200 defense, and when it destroys a monster with 0 attack by battle, you can special summon that monster from the graveyard to your side of the field in defense position, but that monster's effect is negated. While a normal summonable archetype of Goyo Guardian sounds like a decent idea, Sila's usage is highly limited compared to her little sister, Reptilian Viper. Viper steals a monster outside of the battle phase, is a level 2 tuner so it can be used for synchro plays, unless the monster is an Xyz of course, and Sila is most likely to get blown up by the opponent next turn, along with the monster it stole. In the end, Sila's only purpose seems to be stealing monsters to use for battle, but fairly slowly and awkwardly. But hey, it's a decent beat stick, I guess, and if the opponent really has no resources left, it can steal another potential beater, so I guess having one of them wouldn't hurt that much. Now, asking the real questions, I need to know which one of these mouths leads to the anus. Reptilian Medusa looking suspiciously much like the goddamn stupid ass dipshit Bavarian shiver skid from Arc 5 is a level 6 with 2200 attack and 800 defense, and it allows you to send one card from your hand to the graveyard to target one monster on the field, change its attack to zero, and prevent it from changing its battle position. On paper, this sounds like a very nice card that works along with the intended nature of the deck, but the big, fat, ugly level 6 mark is what renders Medusa almost unusable by this deck. Let's say you want to use Naga for her battle protection as tribute father. If you run one Medusa, you'll be sitting on your ass with Naga on the field just waiting to get blown up while you desperately pray to draw into your level 6, and if you run two or three Medusa, you're most often left with a clogged up hand filled with morbidly obese reptiles. Not to mention, the discard cost is a bit too much for this archetype to handle, seeing how none of their cards benefit from being in the graveyard, and you can't always rely on Viper's Rebirth to take back your loss. If you happen to be playing against a way slower deck than the ones that existed during the time Reptilian came out, you might get a chance to summon Medusa, but at that point, instead of running her, you could have drawn into several cards that could have filled this role just as well, if not better. Also, unlike Viper and Gorgon, it targets, so when judged from the perspective of 2016 Yu-Gi-Oh, it's instantly shit. <laughs> Now, as for the actual Reptilian main deck boss monster, we have Reptilian Vaski with 2600 attack and 0 defense. It cannot be normal summoned or set and cannot be special summoned except by tributing two face up monsters with 0 attack from either player's side of the field. Once per turn, you can target one face up monster your opponent controls and destroy it, and there can only be one Reptilian Vaski on the field. Alright, so the destruction effect is mediocre due to it being limited to face up monsters, but I can't stress enough just how much I love this card's summoning condition. Tributing your opponent's monsters did exist at that point in the form of Lava Golem and Volcanic Queen, but other than Mother Spider, Vaski is literally the only monster in the entire game that can inherently special summon itself to your side of the field by tributing only the opponent's monsters. Admittedly, the requirement is for both monsters to have zero attack, which does sound a bit too specific at first, but in combination with Naga as well as some lovely reptilian attacks such as Ojama Trio or Ghost of a Grudge that reduces the attack of all the opponent's monsters to zero if they have eight or more cards in the graveyard, Vaski is surprisingly easy to bring out. It was even cited during Dragon Ruler format to get rid of Draco Sack tokens. Sadly, her actual effect is, again, underwhelming, but just to emphasize a certain fact, because I haven't really flat out said it just yet, Reptilian have access to non-targeting, non-destruction, tribute removal, which is more than I can say for most Legacy of the Worthless cards. However, they're just a bit too slow to actually get this going, and I'm solely adding this because I have a feeling I might be sounding like I'm praising the archetype so far, which I'm most certainly not. As good of a removal card as Vasky can be, it's still very much prone to bricking, but at least it's a way better boss monster than Medusa. 
Speaking of additional boss masters, the final Reptilian monster is their own personal synchro, Reptilian Hydra. It's a level 6 with 2100 attack and 1500 defense, requires a Reptilian tuner and one or more non-tuner monsters, meaning you must use Viper for this one, and when it's synchro summoned, destroy all the opponent's monsters with zero attack and draw one card for each of them. Once again, as an idea, this may seem pretty awesome at first, mass destruction and draw power for a single level 6 synchro. The problems, though, are visible immediately upon inspecting the card just a tiny bit further. First of all, the summoning condition is limited to using Viper, which is a level 2 tuner, meaning you'll most likely have to resort to using specifically level 4 monsters along with it to summon Hydra, mainly because getting out 3 monsters whose total levels equal 6 is a monumental task for this archetype, then if you do summon it, the destruction effect activates and while on a good day it may give you 3 or even 4 draws, the situation that usually happens is a single miserable draw of a card that's probably pointless at that moment, given that you most likely already used up your normal summon. The stats aren't anything special either, because they're more appropriate on a level 4 synchro, so in the end, while Hydra certainly offers the archetype a fair amount of comeback ability, it's a bit too specific to frequently bring out and save your ass. Come on, Danny DeVito, tell us how to defeat the Hydra. Get up on the Hydra's back! Thank you, Blurry Danny. As for the spell and trap lineup, we have three spells and one trap, the first one being Reptilian Spawn, a normal spell that allows you to banish one Reptilian monster from the graveyard to summon two zero attack, zero defense Reptilian tokens to your side of the field. I don't see many Reptilian builds running this, but I personally like it as a one or two off. It can either give protection, maybe Tribute Father if you're running any higher level monsters like Venominon or Medusa even, but primarily I like this card for potentially turning a cloggy Vaski into an easy summon. It may also sound like a decent synchro tool, but you'll be surprised how rarely Viper hits the field along with this card. Spawn is usually not a dead card in your hand, but its potential viability varies with the build, so I'd recommend experimenting with a card to see if it sticks with your playstyle. Reptilian Poison is another normal spell that you can activate only if you control a face-up Reptilian monster. Change one defense position monster your opponent controls to face-up attack position and reduce its attack to zero. Wasn't this what Reptilian themselves were supposed to be doing, you know, instead of being a spell card? The limitation to defense position monsters makes the card a bit too specific and when you have Reptilian monsters already in the field, attack reduction is something you leave for them to do instead of relying on a bricky spell card for it. The only usage I can think of for this thing is when you're controlling Sila, which, as we all know, isn't exactly a Reptilian staple. Reptilian Rage is an equip spell which you can equip to any monster, that monster is treated as reptile type, gains 800 attack, and when this card is destroyed and sent to the graveyard, you can target one monster the opponent controls and it loses 800 attack. This one feels like halfway through designing it, they just stop giving a shit. It's an alright attack boost, but the archetype doesn't really care that much about their own attack points. The destruction effect is just weird because you'd expect it to reduce a monster's attack to zero instead of scratching it for a measly 800. Combined with the fact that the card is also completely generic and applies to any monster, this feels like it wasn't a reptilian card in the first place. You could just name it Mask of Rage or something and it would make just as much sense, if not more. Was this just a random equip card someone looked at and thought it should be a reptilian card for some reason? It's not searchable by the archetype, it does nothing to directly support it, and it just looks stupid. Beep. Oh wait, apparently it's an anime card. Well, I can't exactly say I'm surprised or anything. Point is, don't play Reptilian Rage. And the final Reptilian card is the Continuous Trap, Serpent Suppression. Face-up attack position monsters your opponent controls with zero attack cannot be destroyed by battle by Reptilian monsters. I get the idea, but it's just that the idea happens to be ridiculously stupid. From what I presume to be the point of this card is to enable your reptilian monsters to repeatedly deal damage to the opponent while attacking into a zero attack monster, but reptilian attack values are so minuscule that it barely even matters. If anything, this card works against some of the cards in the archetype, like Sila's Goyo Guardian effect. It feels as if someone really thought reptilian beatdown was a build that had a great big future in front of it, so they made a continuous trap to work with the amazing reptilian poison. Except that you should never run any of these, goodbye. And now for the good old grading. When it comes to consistency, they have access to King of the Feral Limbs, Damage Equals Reptile, and Garna is a pretty good searcher. But one of these is a rank 4 which they rarely have access to, Damage Equals Reptile is an unsearchable continuous trap that relies on you already having monsters, and relying solely on Garna isn't quite the most applicable strategy. When it comes to power, the only one of their monsters with legit high attack is Vaski, but while you could say that their attack values don't matter because of the focus on fighting monsters with zero attack, you can get majorly screwed over if the opponent happens to be controlling none of those. As for comeback ability, well, Naga is always there to stop an OTK in a clutch, Seal or Viper can follow up with a steal, Vaski can just remove things from the field, especially in combination with Ghost of a Grudge. They also have access to stuff like Viper's Rebirth and Evil Dragon Ananta, so yeah, as far as archetypes in this series go, Reptilian have a lot more potential to come back from a beatdown than most others I reviewed. Good job, here's the first Legacy of the Worthless Yellow mark on comeback ability for Reptilian. Now, as for protection, Naga's battle immunity is as far as they go, so there's not much to consider here. 
Concerning the matchups of the deck, while non-targeting attack reduction and tributing is bound to give some decks considerable problems, Reptilian Zone problem is that this kind of win condition is so easily disruptable that most decks can just ignore it if they have literally any kind of access to non-battle removal. So now let's take a look at what could make Reptilian any more playable, which is most certainly possible, in fact, I think this archetype doesn't even need retrains as much as it does some additional support. For example, because this is always a suggestion, a field spell that either helps with attack reduction or provides stun effects on monsters with zero attack, and maybe boost consistency for the archetype by shuffling Reptilian from your hand into the deck in order to search out new ones. Then a few more monsters, preferably a few low-level tuners and level 4 attackers, both with effects related to attack reduction and manipulating monsters with zero attack, and maybe even some swarming capabilities. The archetype definitely needs more monsters that aren't a single usage one-off that gets killed in the following turn but actual formidable threats. Don't make the higher level monsters as frail as they are. And lastly, just some more spell support to help Reptilian reach their win condition and trap support to fuck up the opponent if they let their monsters get their attack reduced, which should be pretty self-explanatory. My main gripe with Reptilian is that they don't really do anything substantially wrong, it's just that what they do do is seriously underwhelming. I genuinely believe this is an archetype that could have easily taken off given the variety of removal options it already offers to the player, it just needed some more relevant cards to help achieve that removal successfully. Sadly, the team of Reptilian seems to be all but abandoned, but while we may not exactly see Snake Lady in Yu-Gi-Oh anytime soon, a new archetype focused on absolute attack reduction might just appear at some point again in the future given that it's a legitimately interesting playstyle. <coughs> and now that we're done with that, let's move on to 5D's Shenanigans Chapter 2 featuring Reactionists. I mean, reactors. They were used in 5Ds by Mr. Anatomy Nightmare, and based on what by all means sounds like an obnoxious gameplay concept to deal with, as in destroying cards immediately upon activation and burn damage. So why did this never take off? Let's take a look at their first monster, Spell Reactor... Ray. It's a level 3 with 1200 attack and 900 defense, and once per turn when your opponent activates a spell card, you can destroy it and inflict 800 damage to the opponent. As in, unless it's a continuous, it doesn't negate. The stats are complete shit, but the burn is alright, and the card can be somewhat useful nowadays that there's an abundance of pendulum monsters and field spells in the game. Naturally, decks that don't specifically rely on a single one of these don't really care that much about Spell Reactor, but considering the fact that it comes from a way slower format and that it has the most applicable usage, I'd say this is the least bad of their monsters. The next one is Trap Reactor... Wi-Fi, I guess, and it's a level 4 Dark Machine with 800 attack and 1800 defense, and it has the exact same effect as Spell Reactor, only, of course, for traps. While this is a decent counter for some unexpected plot gates or stuff like Fiendish Chain or even the Phantom Knight trap cards, I feel it's far less useful than Spell Reactor, mainly because its area of expertise is a lot more narrow. Given the fact that traps are slower than spells by nature, there's a high chance that Trap Reactor will get destroyed before it has a chance to destroy anything itself, unlike Spell Reactor, who's most certainly capable of disrupting the opponent's plays as soon as their turn comes up. If there's really nothing else you can play, setting Trap Reactor and hoping the opponent can't run over it so that you can hopefully blow up some traps in the next turn is a somewhat tolerable first turn option. Their next monster is Summon Reactor Suk. It's a level 5 Dark Machine with 2000 attack and 1400 defense, and the first time a monster is summoned to your opponent's side of the field each turn, inflict 800 damage to the opponent. During the battle phase of the turn this effect was activated, you can negate the attack of one monster the opponent controls. You can send one face-up Trap Reactor YFI, Spell Reactor RE, and this face-up card to the graveyard to special summon one Flying Fortress Sky Fire from your hand, deck or graveyard. We'll get to that last part in a minute, but let's take a look at this card first. So, it's a level 5 in an archetype that has absolutely no ways of generating Tribute Father, so that's mostly just for Flare, considering the effect is nothing special and its stats are pretty average for a level 5. Mind you, unlike its spell and trap counterparts, it doesn't destroy anything along with dealing burn damage, and if it just so happens to leave the field before the battle phase, the attack negation effect doesn't apply. So, this easily seems like the worst of the trio, but what about that last effect? Well, like shitty, rusty World War II era Super Quantums, reactors can combine themselves into the shitty, rusty World War II era Great Magnus. SK, YFI, and RE combine into Flying Fortress Sky Fire. Spy. Absolutely majestic. Skyfire is a level 8 wind machine with 3000 attack and 2500 defense, cannot be normal summoned or set, and can only be special summoned with summon reactor's effect. Once per turn, you can discard one card to target one card the opponent controls and destroy it. Once during each of your opponent's turns, you can activate one of these effects. When your opponent normal or special summons a monster, destroy it and burn the opponent for 800 damage, or when the opponent sets a card, destroy it and burn it for 800 damage. What went wrong here? 
How did they even manage to fuck this up? It seems like the simplest concept to grasp. Stack the effects of other reactor monsters on it and give it negation. Bam! Suddenly you have an actually formidable boss monster. The once per turn destruction of anything on the field during your turn is a nice feature coming off from Vaski, but why do you have to choose between one of the two other effects? Obviously we're gonna use monster destruction 90% of the time because Skyfire is insanely easy to bait out, and then it's gonna turn out that the set card was Fiendish Chain, Skilled Rain, Forbidden Chalice, Book of Moon, or any other metric fuckton of cards that take care of this fat ass as easily as dropping smashing ground on the field. Back when the card was released and you were playing against a 6 year old who might have let you summon this thing out of pity, destroying any monster they summon and then blowing up their back row during your turn could have been a cool strategy, but that shit didn't fly in competitive back in 2009 let alone today. It doesn't even float into anything, presumably because they ran out of space to write on the card. To add to all of this, Skyfire might have one of the funniest cases of TCG censorship in the game, seeing how the American release quite literally castrated his massive rocket schlong. This could have been an amazing boss monster, but as it stands, it's too much effort for too little payoff. Since reactors weren't quite an archetype just yet due to a lack of any specific support cards, here's a synchro monster of all things. Dark Flattop is a level 8 dark machine with 0 attack and 3000 defense, and requires 1 dark tuner and 1 or more non-tuner machine type monsters. Once per turn you can target one reactor monster or flying fortress sky fire in your graveyard and special summon it ignoring its summoning conditions. If this card is destroyed and sent to the graveyard you can special summon one level 5 or lower machine type monster from your hand. If this thing was one level lower summoning it would be astronomically easier since black salvo can fetch a trap reactor from the graveyard for an easy synchro but that one additional level star had to ruin all the fun. For what it takes to summon it this thing should special summon reactors from the deck hand or graveyard as opposed to its ignition effect only working with the graveyard and the flow only working with a hand. And if you thought you could foolish burial a Skyfire and instantly revive it with this, well then friend, you're getting disqualified because that there Skyfire needs to be properly special summoned first before getting brought back from the graveyard. So don't you ignore those summoning conditions no matter what Konami tells you. The final card in this confusing bunch is the normal trap fake explosion. I know, I thought this was Monarch support too at first given the lack of any reactors on the picture. Anyway, you can activate it when an opponent's monster declares an attack. Monsters cannot be destroyed by this battle, and after damage calculation, special summon one summon reactor SK from your hand or graveyard. But again, what about the goddamn sons of bitch in deck? I sincerely don't think the archetype's initial consistency is really that amazing as to warrant this kind of nonsensical limitation. The funny thing is, this card's anime effect in its first usage only allowed you to special summon from the hand, but it wasn't even related to summon reactor, it was any level 5 monster. Limiting that to the hand would be completely understandable, but in the form it's in right now, it's a shittier waboku with the ability to occasionally help you make your plays. So now let's go ahead and throw down a grade or two or five. As for consistency, they solely rely on mediocre outside support to bring anything to the hand, let alone the field. For example, the Symphonic Fourier engine and Armageddonite combined with some revival, which still doesn't even remotely enable them to swarm the field like they're supposed to. When it comes to power, their only actual strong monster has 3000 attack and occasionally decent destruction effects, but it's nearly impossible to summon. The entirety of their comeback ability lies in Dark Flattop, which is, again, barely summonable if you're losing the game, and even if it wasn't, reviving Skyfire is something that rarely ever happens and reviving reactors won't exactly get you anywhere. Protection exists in the form of Fake Explosion, which is really not that much protection, since at that point you might as well just run Waboku. Fake Explosion's actual purpose is bringing out Summon Reactor. As for the versatility, there are some decks that can be screwed over by Spell Reactor or even Skyfire if you manage to bring it out, but those are a bit too few and far between to matter. Personally, I would never want to improve Reactor, since this kind of passively aggressive playstyle is absolutely disgusting to me, but it's a thing I gotta do, so let's see. First of all, swarming and floating effects on monsters, because getting your reactors destroyed in some Thing you can barely come back from due to a lack of access to Dark Flattop. Speaking of which, give the Archetype a special summonable tuner with variable levels between 3 and 5, but make it limited to synchro plays with reactors so that you can access Dark Flattop easier. Also, by the way, please improve Dark Flattop, make its summon range a lot wider than just the hand and graveyard, and make the floating actually pay off. And speaking of big ass level 8 monsters, stack some goddamn negation on Skyfire, because the way things are right now, having the 3 reactors on the field nets you better results than anything Skyfire does. And finally, give them some more trigger based protection akin to fake explosion but actually worth it. I don't like reactors. I like their artwork and that's as far as it goes. Frankly I'm happy they ditched this idea as fast as they did because I feel they would be absolutely dreadful to play against if they had access to more consistency or even negation. I am running out of pictures to use for this segment so let's just move on to the next archetype. 
Here we have Phantom Beasts, as in the Beast Warrior archetype, and not these things, although if Mecha Phantom Beasts were just slightly worse, they would be prime legacy of worthless material. Phantom Beasts were based on the anime effects of the so-called White Knight monsters, and I presume directly adapting White Knights was avoided for two reasons. The first one being that we already had a few White Knight monsters, so they wanted to avoid confusion, and the second being that Konami was considerate enough to avoid appropriating the culture of vehemently defending random women on the internet. A card that falls into the archetype due to its OCG name is Yugi's extremely old and painfully used as Gazelle, the King of Mythical Beasts, as well as the Fusion Chimera, the Flying Mythical Beast, which was retroactively made a Phantom Beast monster. But since it has little to nothing to do with the archetype and running its fusion materials will do you more harm than good, I'm just gonna skip over it in card effects in order to save our precious time. Their first monster is Phantom Beast Thunder Pegasus, or as I like to call him, Amazing Horse, a level 4 light beast warrior with 700 attack and 2000 defense, and when the opponent declares an attack on a Phantom Beast monster you control, you can banish this card from the graveyard to prevent that monster from being destroyed by battle and make the battle damage zero. For the time of its release, this was an alright card, given that it was released a year before Necro Gardener, and on top of the decent battle protection, it's also a 2k wall, making it an ideal first turn face down in the old ages of this deck. It's an okay card, setting the tone for the rest of the under-supported archetype, which continues with Phantom Beast Crosswing. Is that like a new KFC special? The brand new Phantom Beast Crosswing Deluxe? Mmm, tastes like monster. Anyway, it's a level 4 light beast warrior with 1300 attack and defense, and while it's in the graveyard, all phantom beast monsters you control gain 300 attack. This is pretty much a permanent attack boost that can stack up to 900 if you fill up the graveyard with 3 of them, turning your phantom beast into legit formidable beaters, but it can be a bit of a dead draw because its only usage is limited to raising the attack of monsters already on the field, and that's after it dies. A bit too inconsistent to set up, but worth running due to a sheer lack of options. Phantom Beast Outback Canadian is a level 4 Earth Beast Warrior with 1700 attack and 0 defense, and its only effect is that it deals piercing damage. Kinda underwhelming at first, but boosted with Crosswing and a certain trap card of theirs, he can turn into a pretty huge beat stick, but as it sometimes so happens, here we have a case of a card being used for what it is as opposed to what it does, because this might as well just be a vanilla, considering that in a Phantom Beast deck you will run it mainly because they have no other level 4 beaters. And speaking of Phantom Beast beaters, here's their boss monster, Phantom Beast Rock Lizard, a level 7 dark Beast Warrior with 2200 attack and 2000 defense, and you can normal summon it with one tribute if you're tributing a Phantom Beast monster. When it destroys a monster by battle, inflict 500 damage to the opponent, and if it's destroyed by your opponent's card effect and sent to the graveyard, inflict 2000 damage to the opponent. The stats are pretty terrible for a level 7, but presumably that's because nobody in their right mind is gonna summon this with two tributes, so the stat line is more akin to a level 6. The attack burn is just there, it's nothing special really, and while the big nasty 2k burn can be pretty relevant for the outcome of the duel, seeing how this archetype is heavily based on dealing damage, unless Rock Lizard is heavily boosted by Crosswing and the Trap as well as protected by Pegasus, there's usually no problem with destroying it by battle or, you know, getting rid of it by other means. It's not necessarily a bad card and the artwork is absolutely sick, but it could definitely be a lot better. Their last card is Horn of the Phantom Beast. Jesus Christ, did somebody rip that thing off Wildhorn's head? That must have hurt. So, it's a normal trap that you can equip to one Beast or Beast Warrior type monster you control, it gains 800 attack and each time it destroys a monster by battle and sends it to the graveyard, draw one card. So, this is actually a pretty good card, no question about it. For God knows how long after its release in 2010, almost every single beatdown focused Beast and Beast Warrior deck ran at least two of these. The attack boost is pretty high, the draw power is neat, and even though it might as well not be a Phantom Beast card because nothing in the archetype can exactly interact with it, it's very welcome in the deck due to its damage dealing playstyle. And just like that, we're done with Phantom Beasts. So about them grades. Their consistency is pretty much not a thing, as none of their cards actually do anything about it. With a Fire Fist engine, it becomes significantly easier to manage them through your hand and graveyard, but at that point there's a high chance that the non-existent speed of the Phantom Beast might actually dampen said engine if you keep drawing into them. When it comes to power, meh, fuck it, it's perfectly respectable for a 2006 archetype. Consistency isn't taken into consideration when looking at the power aspect, so I'd say 3 Crosswing combined with Horn of the Phantom Beast makes for some legit power output. Their comeback ability relies completely on cards unrelated to the archetype, type and there isn't exactly many of those that help out beast warriors, so this is a red. The protection, as good as I consider Amazing Horse to be, is basically just that, banishing himself from the graveyard for battle protection and that's about it. And as for the versatility, anything that has access to removal outside of the battle phase can take care of them super easily. Now, here's that segment where I suggest what could have been done to improve an archetype, but unlike Genex and v who were just so terrible and nonsensical that I couldn't think of any suggestions, the lack of anything tangible in Phantom Beast support prevents me from making a conclusion conclusion on what this archetype's goal is supposed to be. Most I can get from it is that some of their cards like being in a graveyard, some like smacking things really really hard, and all of their cards are pretty much unplayable without fire fists. So uh, give them something to send cards to the graveyard, give them some monsters that smack really really hard, and here's a picture of Wildhorn after his botched operation. <laughs>
Ladies, mental drain rail bikes and rail cars, thank you for watching this episode of Ranked and Yu-Gi-Oh's Legacy of the Worthless. If you liked it, do remember to subscribe. And in the description, you can even find a link to a Yu-Gi-Oh Discord server I moderate, so feel free to join and be a friend, and maybe even get banned if you don't want to be a friend. Nonetheless, I am Rata of Ranked and Yu-Gi-Oh, love you all, and I'll see you next time. Also, the last anime reptilians were Gorgon and Gardner.